Welcome back. In this video, we're going to utilize all of the knowledge that we've gained through the previous videos, and we're going to start working with variables. So here we're going to create two types of variables. First is our own custom personal variable that we're going to create, update the value to, and then read the value on screen within the remote. The second type is a dynamic variable, one which we created during the last video when we added our own receiver. The home remote is doing some work behind the scenes to update those dynamic variables automatically. However, because they're already there, we can access them and read them as text as well if we want to. Currently, that dynamic variable is being read by the slider control. So to get started with our first custom variable, under devices, we're going to right click, add source, and choose virtual device. This is a bit of a hacky way to do things. And instead of virtual device name, I'm just going to call mine variables. Within the variables device, right click and choose to add a variable. I'm going to call this variable name last direction. I don't need to put a default value here, but it is an option. And I'll click OK. Now I have my last direction variable and it's ready to be referenced from something within the remote. So to get started with that, I'm going to come over to controls, choose to use a text label, and I'm just going to draw it down here in the bottom left hand uh, portion of this. Now I'm going to do some quick customizations of the UI. Put it right in its correct spot. And for the text, normally when you're creating a label, you would put some static text here, such as a word or numerical value. But in this case, we want this text to dynamically update based on whatever the current value, uh, variable value is. So instead, what we're going to do is come over and click the ellipses choose to bind this to a device, clicking the drop down here, and here's my custom variable name waiting for us, last direction. We're gonna click OK. So now basically what we have on our hands is we have an empty bucket, which is our empty variable, and we have a place for that bucket to dump out here on the screen. So now the only step left is to put things into that bucket that are going to be displayed. In this case, what I want to do is just display the text of whichever the most recent direction button is that's been pressed, up, down, left, or right. To do so, I'm going to start with the up button. I'm going to scroll down here in the properties until I get to the trigger section. We already have a trigger here waiting for us for what happens when the event clicked of this button fires. What action do we want? Well, we want a data action. And for the binding, I'm going to choose my custom variable name, last direction. And what do we want to put in that bucket? Well, we want it to equal the word up. Tab to confirm. And now I'm just going to do that same update to the left. And to the right. And down. Now, effectively what we're doing is each time one of these buttons is clicked, it's going to put that text value into our last direction variable. And this label down here is just going to display whatever happens to be in the last direction variable. It's time to test it out. We'll click start to begin the simulation. And right off the bat, you can tell that our text variable is blank. And that's because our bucket is still empty. It has a null value. To put our first value into the bucket, well, we'll just click the up button. And now you can see that up is being displayed because our last direction variable now has the value equal to up. We can do the same with left, right, and down. Now the variable, like all variables, don't hold any historical value, but it does show us whatever the most recent value is. And this can be critical for non-native navigational elements or even keeping track of things like the power status of the device that does not have any native feedback. So what's next? Well, let's talk some more about that dynamic variable with the volume of our receiver. Let's stop the simulator and take a look at that under the main zone of my receiver. You can see here that I have audio volume as a capability, which means that behind the scenes, I have a dynamic uh, dot volume device object. And the way that I want to access that is that I think in addition to having my volume displayed here as a slider element, I also want to have the actual volume output as text. I think that might be kind of handy. So what I'm going to do, similar to before, is I'm going to start by creating a label. I'm going to 
draw that down here below my slider element. And this time for the text, I'm gonna choose a binding. And this time I'm just gonna use one of the built-in device object ones. I'm gonna look under here for TXNR636 zone one, and I'm looking for the dot volume. I found it here, click okay, and let's see what that looks like. Great, so what we have is we're currently at 44% volume. And it's important to know what's happening here behind the scenes because this percentage is actually pretty critical. We talked about it a little bit in the last video. I'll stop, stop the simulation here for just a moment to go over the details. Over on the slider element, you can see that what we have is a zero to 100 value on this slider. Now my particular receiver does not have zero to 100 volume options. In fact, it has zero to 68, 68 is the maximum. And other receivers are gonna be different than that. Some receivers can go negative decibels and positive decibels and uh, be much larger values than 100. So the device uh, object behind the scenes is automatically converting that down to a percentage so that it then fits within the bounds of zero to 100. So what that means is that device object is bound to a zero to 100 value. In this case, we are at 44%. And I'm gonna make some small modifications over on the uh, receiver again so you can see those values change. But what I want you to notice is that they're not necessarily changing by an individual integer where we might not go from 45, 44 to 45. Instead, we may go from 45 to 46, for example. Let's take a look at that now. So this is important information because if we want to discreetly change the volume control, that is not necessarily increment it by one or decrement it by one, but also if we wanted to just say as part of our setup routine, and I've seen this before personally where a customer wants the volume to always start at volume 40. So that means if they turn their system off, maybe they were watching a really loud show because they had the volume really cranked up, it's all the way up at 60 then the next time they turn on the system, it doesn't blow their eardrums out when they go to a different source. So during the scripting, we may discreetly call out volume set to 40 for this particular device. Now, ordinarily for me, the last thing I would do here is clean up the UI a bit by adjusting the margins, um, maybe deleting the height and width uh, d discrete values, that way things scale dynamically. However, in this case, I know that there's a bug and if I was to delete the height and width um, making everything dynamic. Uh, it's just not gonna display that label at all in the designer. Um, so instead, I'm just gonna move things into position for the time being. By the time this video gets published, that bug may already be uh, eliminated. So I hope you can see in this video how extremely powerful variables can be, both those created by the designer and those you manually create to keep track of different things as well. That's all for this one.